Hey there, small business owners. Ever feel like you're always putting off updating your website? For most of you out there, building and maintaining an online presence can be overwhelming. Your day-to-day schedule can greatly impact necessary tasks like keeping your website up to date and planning marketing campaigns to stay competitive. Brand You Love offers monthly packages for website maintenance, marketing campaigns that help keep current customers engaged while attracting new ones, and social media strategies that keep you in touch with your customers. At Brand You Love, we do the legwork for you, so you don't have to. Contact us today at brand, the letter U, love.com. Welcome to Desert City, a D&D 5e actual play produced by TTRP Theater. I'm your DM, Jazz. I'm joined today by Chris Freedom as Theo, Duke Walter as Ellen, and Dean Martin Jr. as Kevin. Thanks for tuning in to episode 11, and if you've been listening, welcome back. Let us know what you think. You can find us on Twitter at RenCityPod, that's R-E-N-C-I-T-Y-P-O-D, or you can search YouTube or Patreon for TTRP Theater. And if you find us, please rate, like, review, subscribe, comment, engage all the things. I can't believe that we're already at episode 11. The game is starting to take paths that I didn't anticipate. I cannot wait to see what paths the players take me down. It's been an absolute pleasure to DM this group, and it is challenging me in surprising ways. I hope that you can sit back and enjoy the ride. I know we are. All right. Without further ado, let's get on with the show. First, let's start with a little recap. We opened up at the Spitting Camel, where Ellen shared his concerns with Theo about the mission and Wylam his concerns with Kevin. Kevin declined any assistance from the Thieves' Guild, but did give his copper anti-entry coin to Wylam. You all met up for a hearty breakfast where Gorn urged you to meet Sheeny at Wylam's request and bring the bangle you obtained from the copy anti to her. You went to the Oasis Theater where you met from the Sheeny what? Sorry? From the what? From the copy copy ante? The copper <laughs> the copper ante. Or the copper in. It really depends on the episode that you're listening to. Right. You went to the Oasis Theater where you met Sheeny, Bentel, and Oliver, and by a cruel twist of fate, needed to assist them in their production of The Shadows of the Jinn. You handled the role admirably and were rewarded with information regarding Sheeny's partner, the pirate Jeb, not Jim and his pursuit of the god's agate. She shared that she believed it was in possession of the bullywugs, commonly believed to be tall tales in modern Kalimport. After a brief discussion in some new intellectual property, Ellen and Lerlani, you departed toward the glistening harem. You were followed by one of Wylam's men, and confronted him, and after a particularly intimidating speech by Theo, he pissed himself and ran away, but not before Ellen sent a forceful message to Wylam. At the glistening harem, you were greeted by Trechtin, and after a short wait, were led to the back hall where you met with Perlon. After a quick introduction and another NPC mesmerized by Kevin's sexiness, Erlani shared what he knew about Dawnbringer Eos Morningwood. He confirmed at the onset of his political run, the Church of Lathander backed him, in that he and Morningwood became friends, and this is about the time that Morningwood fell ill. They were researching his affliction and found evidence that suggested its origin was the result of gin magic, possibly even from the city founders themselves. When bringing this to the attention of Sunrise Lord Dawil, the High Cleric of Lathander, it was immediately dismissed. Shortly afterward, the church pulled out of Erlani's political campaign, and rumors suggested that the church had switched sides to seal passion. Erlani and his confidants became a, the focus of a smear campaign that buried him and his political aspirations under a mountain of controversy. He confirmed that the existence of the god's agate was real, 
uh, and that he and Pirate Jeb were creating it before the trail went cold. Alan shared what he learned from Cassandra, which shook Erlani and seemed to confirm both their suspicions about corruption within the church and begged Ellen not to bring the agate to the church. He believed that Morningwood's mind was deteriorating, clouding his judgment, and that there were alternative options to the church for saving him, and that's where we are now. You are still with Erlani, finishing up the conversation in the booth at the Glistening Harem. The last thing that he said to you guys was, I beg you, do not bring the agate to the church. He follows up. I don't know where the agate is, but I am certain that the road to it leads through Silpasha Irakel. And if that is the case, you should all be very, very careful moving forward. There is one more thing that, if you would be willing, it would be my honor. In the back, there is a very powerful and magical room. And I'd like to take you there so that we can meditate together. Is this a sex thing? We are in a brothel. This could be a sex thing, I guess, if you were like one of those people that really got off on like the intellectual pursuit of knowledge it's with not other a sex people. Thing. But no, there'll be no genitals exchanged. Um, At unless, least, I mean, I'm not planning on that. You know, the exchanging. You get your genitals out, who knows what's going to happen? I mean, if it happens, it happens, but... <laughs> I'm going to start calling that the exchanging of genitals. I like that. Exchanging of genitals. <laughs> I'm going to give you my genitals, and listen, you're going to give me listen, your genitals. You don't know how fucking orcs do it. You don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he does, actually. He's a half-orc. He's a... Chris doesn't know. <laughs> Theo might, but Chris. Oh, Theo know. might. Right, yeah, that's true. Chris, Chris might not. I got the feeling Theo doesn't either. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. Let's fall in love. Huh? When a mommy and a daddy feel a certain way about each other, they give their genitals to each other. <laughs> they exchange genitals. <laughs> 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 uh, Good stuff. Uh, yeah, fuck it. Let's go to the back room. Yeah. Um, if you think it will help Erlani, I'm more than happy. I uh, These last couple days have been a lot. Theo jumps up like an eager beaver headed toward the back room. Oh, boy. Got to make it weird. So you guys start to walk towards the back room. You are led down a long hallway with carpet on each side, seeming to tuck away from the rest of the harem. It winds to the left, down a little bit of stairwell, and then tucked away behind a concealed passage is an entrance, and it's guarded by the hushed whispers of stone walls. This sanctum is a chamber of mysteries where arcane dances with the ethereal. As you push aside the heavy tapestry that disguise the entrance, a soft, pulsating glow spills into the corridor, revealing a space adorned with crystalline wonders. The air thick with an otherworldly resonance resonates with the harmonious hum of magic. The walls, ceiling, and floor of the room are a canvas of crystalline artistry. Luminescent gemstones of varying hues are embedded within the stone surfaces casting a gentle kaleidoscopic illumination that shifts with an unseen energy. At the heart of the room, a colossal crystal ball perched upon an altar of pure crystal, its smooth surface reflecting the ambient glow. Guardians of stone sculpted in the likeness of mythical creatures stand sentinel at each corner, their crystal eyes gleaming with an unspoken sentience. These silent watchers are both protectors 
and witnesses to the arcane endeavors that transpire within these walls. Please, each of you, let us surround the orb and place your hands upon it. Dude. Weird. I think this is weirder than a sex thing. Yeah, I feel like we're going to get our genitals out. Theo steps up and puts his hands on. Ellen also steps forward and tentatively kind of just puts a couple of fingers on to make sure it's not going to hurt. Start with a couple of fingers. And then realizes that it's not and places his full hand on the crystal ball. Kevin's going to go up underneath. He's going to get low on that ball. Hold it from underneath. You know what I'm saying? Yep. You got your orb there. He's he's getting low on it, just in case. You know. Once all four people's hands are on the ball, Erlani takes a deep breath and asks you, "Will you please breathe with me, in and out, in and out." And after a few minutes of this intense breathing, he begins a low hum. Suddenly, flash. Theo, you are being held by your orcish mother. She is singing you a song. She is stroking your face and brushing your hair. Gromka hear the echoes of our past In the clans embrace your sleep will last The stars above light gleaming eyes Guard your dreams where darkness lies Gomar close your eyes and drift away In the wild where our spirits play Dream young warrior in honor and might In the heart of darkness find your light suddenly she stops you see people coming in you see your mom being dragged away huge faces are staring at you you can't make them out her comb drops to the floor it still has some strands of her hair in it a large human hand bearing the ring of lafander puts the comb in your lap flash Theo, you're a teenager. You're fighting with a much larger kid. You're fighting over something silly, like cutting in line for bread. The argument turns into fisticuffs. Theo brings the kid nearly to death. Theo, what are you doing? This is not the way. Flash. You're in the cathedral. You've just gotten reprimanded by Morningwood. You have the comb out. What are you saying to Lathander right now? Lathander, bring me wisdom. Bring me patience. Bring me insight. Let me know what I need to know. Let me learn the lessons that are in right timing for me. Let me go forth with faith and confidence that I don't stand alone. That not only is is my mother with me, but that you and all of your angels stand behind me in force. When the time is right, tell me the truth about what happened to my mother. I follow your lead into the light on behalf of the light. As you finish your prayer, you see Lathander's light surround the comb, causing it to beam with an otherworldly glow and touch your fingertips. Flash. Ellen. You're young, eight years old. You're walking down the street, poor, hungry, 
you see an old man in ornate robes hobbling down the street. You see a coin purse hanging by his side. You steady your hand and quietly sneak up, reaching your hand out for the coin purse. The old man catches you and grabs your hand. What are you doing, boy? You will pay for your petty thievery. We wizards do not suffer the antics of fools. The old man's hand starts to glow. Tendrils of red energy start to surround Ellen's wrist. The old man reaches his opposite hand back to strike Ellen. Morningwood appears and distracts the old man with a flash of light. He bends down to you. What is it you desire, young one? I'm... I'm just so hungry. It is a difficult thing to master your desires when you lack basic sustenance. Would you like some bread? And I nod my head, keeping my eyes averted. He reaches into a satchel and grabs a piece of bread. It's intact. It's not moldy. Looks like it was just obtained today. And extends it to you. Look at the bread and just kind of corner my eye, glance up at him. Snatch it and run. He stops you. He places his hand on your shoulder. Looks you in the eye and says, There is a better way. And you take off, running into the crowd. Flash. Kevin, you're holding the orb in the room with Theo and Ellen and Erlani. Nothing seems out of the ordinary. One of the guardian statues in the form of a horse comes to life and starts walking towards you. It nuzzles its nose in your hands and you're immediately transported to the stable on the day of your release from the orcish prison in your 15th year of life. You're getting the horses ready for the journey. Unlike your orcish captors, the horses don't fear you and in fact seem calm when they look into your sparkling blue eyes. You load up and you're on the road driving the carriage of the orcish captain when you're stopped by a young man in flowing robes. A human man, his horse, is moving slowly. Is it sick? Is it tired? Excuse me, I need some assistance. We're in the middle of a long journey and my horse has fallen ill. Is there anything you can do? Yeah, of course. Let's, uh, let's lead her into the stable and get her something in her stomach. So you start to lead the horses towards the stable. You seem so confident with them. How is it that you... How is it that you came to be in the employ of your... of your captain? Uh, it was either that or get your hands cut off for thievery. Hmm. A troubled past. Not so much. Just hungry. You seem to have a way with the animals. I I usually see that in patient people. Animals have a sense of good and bad, regardless of the things that society tells us are bad. Well, animals also have a uh, tendency for beauty. They don't like my orc captors. They're nothing to look at. They're fearful that they're going to eat them. Mm. Still... They would associate you with them and... Huh. Very, very interesting. He's gonna make a, a, a like a, a soothing mix, you know? He's got a little mix. He he dumps some extra things into a, a bag of oats that uh, tend to help settle a horse's stomach. And he's gonna, put, he's gonna strap the feed bag to her. You know, I could always use a man like you in my employ. Should you ever make it to the palace, Wolf? Please look me up. 
My name is Eos Morningwood, and I can be found at the Church of Lathand. I'm currently incarcerated. There's no getting to the palace for me. I only go where they go. I understand. He disappears for a moment and appears to be engaged in a long conversation with the orcish captain. The orcish captain is looking back and forth between you, between him, between the carriage. When Morningwood pulls out a large sack of coin, the orcish captain looks at it and takes it. Flash! You're back, all three of you, in the present time. Erlani opens up his eyes. I wish you the best of luck on your quest. And if there's anything I can do to help, you know where to find me. Ellen, you now have the ability of being able to cast uh, spells uh, as the arcane trickster. Um, the energy that you felt uh, from the wizard helped unleash some innate arcane ability that you had. In addition, one of the bangles that you were wearing was imbued with this magical energy. And now you are allowed to cast Mage Hand as a bonus action while you're wearing the bangle. Theo, your comb has become an amulet of healing. It's called the love of mother. Once per long rest, as long as it's visible, any player can look at the comb and as a bonus action, receive five hit points automatically. And Kevin, your dookie chain, dookie chain. has also been imbued in magic. While you're wearing the dookie chain, you have advantage on any animal handling check. And it has a charge that you can use once per long rest, which you can cast a first level speak with animals. Cool. I've got them built in D&D Beyond, and I will try and figure out how to assign them to your characters. Any questions? When you say somebody can look at the comb and and get five extra hit points is that yep. that's for to 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 cause damage to someone else or no, to, to heal. protect yourself yeah healing heal. yep basically like if it's in your pocket it can't be used but if it's visible uh if you're in combat for example um anybody uh including oh. you you or anybody else um, if they're in combat can or whenever can look at it as a bonus action and get five hit points back. So for example, okay. if you were in combat, you. you could, you know, take a crack at somebody and then as your action, then as your bonus action, get some healing points. It, it wouldn't so turn, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't work for a downed person, right? If somebody was down to zero hit points and in death saves, but right. in the moment, if we're conscious, okay. You have to eyeball it. Just uh, the term hit hit was what threw me off. I see it on the sheet now. Um, I didn't know that was called hit points. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So you, you don't just look at it and gain five hit points. They, there's some summoning, there's some power word nope. or... Nope, you just look at it. I mean, so if it's just hanging off his belt, everybody that looks at it is going to gain five hit points or... You guys or, can. Or just his allies. Just his allies. Okay, gotcha. It's once per long. It's only once per long rest, though, right? Isn't that what you said? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We need the boost. So it can only do it one time. Once a day. Um, I pull my hands away, and I have um, I have a couple of like well made, fairly intricate um, leather bands around my wrists, and. Uh, I reach down and kind of rub my wrist, uh, my right wrist with my left hand and kind of move the, move the bracelet a little bit. And you can see, well, zoom in. Um, you can see some scarring 
underneath the bracelet. And I'm just kind of rubbing my wrist as we uh, turn and kind of come back together as a group, you know, back into consciousness. All right. What would you guys like to do next? Theo uh, turns around. Um, Thank you. This is, this has been a, an exceedingly positive experience. I can't thank you enough. And with all the confidence turns and, and walks toward the door. It has been my pleasure. We're going to fix this. Let's go find this thing. If you decide to try and find Yurikel, you may want to seek out his assistant. Well, I don't know if assistant's the right word for it. His associate, Stella May Inkerton. He oversees many stands around the ward. He sells produce and other goods, and he's very influential in the import-export trade. I would imagine that if there was somebody who might know about the agate and its location, it, it might be him. Is there anything you can give us on him that might help us? You know, I mean, I doubt he. we can, as strangers to this person, that we'll be able to gain any sort of access. It is rumored that Stella May may be upset with Yurikel uh, for cutting him out out of some import-export deals that are happening in, in Calimport. So I don't know that they're on the best of terms, and you may be able to use that to your advantage. He may even be of, in possession of the agate himself. I, I don't know. It's Our trail went cold somewhere with Stella May. So I don't know much more than that. Well, it's more than we knew when we walked in. Um, what do you think, guys? Let's go get him. Kevin, are you sticking around and hanging out with your new wife? What are you doing? That's not, that's not going to be canon. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that, that, didn't make, that didn't make the cut. You guys ought to know something. I'm wondering what saved me from a life of hardship. I was given a life sentence by the orcs for stealing a wineskin full of yak milk because I was useful to them. They were never going to release me. They were never going to free me. I'm all into the end for Morningwood. Well, then it seems we have a common goal. We're all very fond of Morningwood. Hey, I've got the doogie chain. I can speak with Theo now. <laughs> Theo's not an animal. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, rude rude your mother's an animal all right let's get out of here oh shit what's the matter uh guitar picks can be extremely flammable really why what is that sentence that is not a <laughs> sentence that has ever been spoken in the history of the english language <laughs> i have a candle and I'm sitting here fucking with it. I and you put a guitar pick I, into the flame I of the candle. Put a guitar pick into the flame of the candle because I had scraped some wax on the table, and I was like, "Oh, I'll melt the wax down." But of course, it's plastic, and so I just had a giant ball of flame in my hand for a second. That was fun. I'm gonna go ahead and put this stuff down. And I'll refocus. <laughs> oh, this is making the cut for sure. There's a, that's a hundred percent going in the episode. <laughs> uh, Jesus Christ. Okay. Oh shit. Oh, no injuries. God. House is intact. All right, we're good. Okay. No Let's third go. degree burns. No ER trips necessary. Thank, thank goodness. Just a little candle wax on the nipples. The tip of my middle finger hurts, but it's it's minimal. There's no bubbles. <sighs> um, we get out 
are you guys okay if we just like make our way to the street to have conversation? Yeah, let's go. Uh, make our way out. We get to the street. Casual stroll, you know, but keeping together. I, I'm. I have a. I have a real desire to go back to the church, and try to. I don't know if we talk to Eos about what we found so far. Um, you know, we obviously, I mean, at least according to Crestwood, we don't want to trust the church, have anything to do with the church. But where are you going? I don't know. Not to the church. Here's the thing, though. I, I just, I want us all to be conscientious that we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Every large institution has questionable people within the ranks. I think it's it's only reasonable to be skeptical with an individual, but I think I don't think we need to I don't think suddenly we need to treat the church as if it's hands off. I, I don't I don't disagree with you, but I think that all of our interactions we need to be wary. Yeah. I agree with that anyway. I think we need to watch what we say. It's a fool's errand to go blind into the church without that skepticism anyway. I feel like I feel like if if I didn't walk around with some some skepticism in my heart, then I would be naive and I would I would just be a sheep. And while Lathander may have a flock of sheep, I am not in my power. In that fashion. Evan, what are you feeling? I feel like we'll have a lot more people following us if we let the church in on what our mission is. Ooh, that's a good point, too. Let's go on with Adam. Okay, well, we need we need to be operating under the idea that we are always being followed. Right. Oh, you're always followed. Yeah. That's that's pretty much been shown to us so far. So, do we need to take a circuitous route? Do we need to do we need to go find this Salome? What was his name? Shelltop? No, that's not right either. Salome. Squeeze, squeeze box. Skitzer Rander. SpongeBob Salome. Here. Put on these fake mustaches. No one will know to follow us. Disguise. Genius. Oh, disguise. That's a good idea. And as we have that conversation, the two of you see Ellen, and then you see Erlani Crestwood. Whoa. Ellen just the image of Ellen becomes the image of Erlani Crestwood. Just, okay, so we did that in private somewhere, not just on the street? No, we're on the street. We're on the street. You're just shape-shifting. I, I don't even, I, I don't think Ellen even realizes that he did it. So in front of Theo and Kevin's eyes, Ellen, all of a sudden, you blink and Erlani Crestwood is standing in front of you. And I, you know, my worry is that our disguises will not, I mean, it's, we're going to have to do some good work to disguise ourselves. We are all. Arlani? Go look in a mirror. Too well known. Go look in a mirror. Do you know what just happened to yourself? What? I'm going to pull my blade out. Put his reflection in it. Think that disguise works, Ellen. And I see the reflection and kind of tilt my head, and then tilt my head the other way. Whoa! Quick, put that blade away. I don't want to get anybody nervous. Uh. Okay. Weird. Yeah. Uh. Um. Okay. Well, that. That will at least help some I guess how did you do that um I don't know we were t- 
talking about disguises, and I was just kind of getting a little animated. I, I I really don't know. I didn't even realize that I'd done it. Wow. All of your actions will be blamed on this individual. Ooh. Okay. And okay. Um how do I what how do I um and I close my eyes and just kind of you can see me take a deep breath and then I'm back to looking like Ella. Wow. That's kind of a cool trick. I uh that's horrifying. Yeah. I'm now going to question everything. I don't... I'm not comfortable with that. I need right now, I need to know how we're going to verify that it's you. How am I going to know? How do you verify that you're you? Did my voice change? I mean, I guess maybe I'm going to have to try to mimic some of those voices. Ooh, Wylam. Oh, God, imagine how we can fuck with Gorn. Oh, yes, this could be fun. Oh, my God, imagine how we could fuck with Gorn. I got to get that accent down. Is um, my name is Wylam. No, that's not it. Uh, shit. I'm gonna have to work. I'm gonna have to work on that. At worst, we could get some gold from Gorn. Oh yeah, no shit. Oh my god, that's a great idea. I say fuck this quest. Let's just go fuck with Gorn. We could make a whole week out of it. We could Easy. totally do this. This would be fun. Yeah, it'll be like that Blue Goats play. Um, oh, what did they call it? Oh, it wasn't. It wasn't Freaky Friday. It was. Um, <laughs> I can't remember, but yeah, it was this. Um, it, it was really funny. It was, you know, like uh, there was this uh, guy that changed with another guy, but really wasn't the guy, and stuck in the body. And yeah, it was. It was. Right. It was funny. Right. It was funny. I remember it from it being a kid. I don't know if it's still that funny, but <laughs> it was funny when I was a kid. It wasn't it wasn't Freaky Friday though. Okay. No, no, I don't think that's what it was called. I think that was a different play. I think that was like a sex thing. That was one of their more adult themed shows. So all right, when when I need to verify that it's you, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you who you are. And the only answer that I will accept as the real Ellen is if you say Kevin's mom. Kevin's mom. Kevin's mom. Why my mom? Why not your mom? No, just if he said he was Ellen, I wouldn't believe him. It's got to be some far out thing. Your mama. I mean, it seems. It Listen, seems we are, we're all talking about Kevin's mom. I, I think it'll fit right in. Don't bring my mother into this. Bring your own mother into this. There's a psychological theory about people when they're young and and trauma with their mothers and, um, you know, how it can manifest in a, in a variety of ways. And, and Theo, I think you are helping to prove this psychological theory in this sense. And just in that, you know, with, um, you know, growing up and, and not knowing about your mother and you just, you just seemed obsessed with everybody else's mom but in this weird kind of sexual way. And it's, I'm just trying to make you cognizant of it. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to, you know, make you feel bad about it. Not at all. I just, um, Oh, listen, Hey, it is what it is. I'm made up of the things that have come before this moment. I, you know, I got a mom thing. Yeah. You got a mom thing. Okay. So the, the Kevin's mom, not peanut butter or, no, you know, Kevin's mom. I'm going to ask you who you are. Or orange cat. Or I'm going to ask you who you are, and you're going to say Kevin's mom. It doesn't have to be sexual. I mean, it can be. It doesn't have to be, but you're making it. It can be sexual. I'm just saying it doesn't have to be. This is Desert City, 
a D&D 5e actual play produced by TTRP Theater. I'm your Dungeon Master Jazz. Theo is played by Chris Freedom. Ellen is played by Duke Walter. Kevin is played by Dean Martin Jr. TTRP Theater is a group of actors, artists, and gamers from all walks of life that play a diverse set of games in a diverse set of styles. We have a wide array of content available for free on YouTube. Search TTRP Theater and subscribe to our channel. Follow us on Twitter at TTRP Theater. We'd love to hear your feedback. Comment on YouTube or tweet about the show using hashtag RenCityPod. That's R-E-N-C-I-T-Y-P-O-D. Or follow us at the same handle, at R-E-N-C-I-T-Y-P-O-D. Be good to one another. See you next time.